friends, it's good to be able to gather in a fairly small group tonight to study God's word. And hopefully we can chat together and uh, support one another and maybe indeed pray for one another as our time together goes on. There's a lot to, to be said for small groups because they do allow us to um, just to get to know one another just a little bit. Um, and that's always very helpful. Let me just commit this time to God in prayer. Almighty and gracious God, whom have we in the heavens high but you, O Lord, alone? So we pray that tonight you would be with us, that you would show us your face and your grace, and that your word would come alive for us and encourage us. There are difficult things in this part of your word, the last chapters of the book of Daniel, and there are things that we could uh, get caught up into all kinds of arguments and disagreements about. But we ask that we will be humble before the word, that we will be humble before the Holy Spirit, the one who gave Daniel these visions and caused him to write them down. We ask that we might uh, read our times and read your word with an eye open to what you have given in scripture and to what you are doing in history. May we look backwards to the days of the Old Testament and the coming of our Saviour. May we look forwards to the return of our Saviour and may we do so in faith and with great confidence. Lord, you give trouble as well as peace to your people through their history. And we recognize that that has continued through the ages and that your people today are troubled by many things. Jesus told us in this world, you will have trouble, you will have tribulation. May we not run away and hide but may we rather walk humbly with the Lord and put our hope and our trust in you. Bless all our loved ones, all our dear ones. Bless the whole congregation. And as we think of other groups meeting in uh, the same way we're meeting tonight, we, we long to be able to be more in and out of one another's homes and to be together in worship, praising the Saviour. Lord, until that time come, May we be thankful that the Lord is in our various homes and is hearing our prayers and that the Lord will even notice when we're upset or when we're down or when we're fearful that the Lord's eye is on us. May your eye be on every one of us now. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's just allow one or two more to join our meeting. It's great to see. I think we have 10 or 11 folk on Zoom and there are probably a few uh, folk over on the YouTube channel as well who can listen but who cannot participate or speak. Um, there's a, a fair chunk of the book of Daniel covered in the last study in this book by David Helm. Uh, the last chapter, I think it starts um, on page 43, the final vision. There are four visions in the second half of the book of Daniel. And the last one seems to cover chapters 10, 11, and 12. Um, and there's really far too much for us to attempt to cover here. Some of you, if you've been in Martin's group, you may have already uh, finished this book. I know some of you got to chapter 12 last time. Uh, so uh, my plan for tonight is to give a wee overview of how the book of Daniel ends, to ask a few discussion questions, and then maybe just to go through the last chapter and a few things in the last chapter uh, for the time that we have together tonight. And I hope that will be encouraging. And if some of you have done it in a previous study or uh, in another group, hopefully it'll still be good to share the things that the Lord has shown you and taught you. The book of Daniel falls into two halves. There's a sort of story of the exiles in Babylon and of how much they suffered and how faithful God was to praying people like Daniel and like those who were cast into the lion's den. The, the Lord um, 
answering the prayers of his people and protecting a remnant among the Jews uh, so that the 70 years in exile would eventually come to an end and there'd be an opportunity for some at least to go home to rebuild. By the second half of the book, you have visions that uh, were given to Daniel and it's not so clear uh, when throughout Daniel's life these visions were given. Uh, Daniel lived a long life. He was an old man. That's the impression we get by the end of the book. Um, he, had, he had lived through the exile and he had uh, lived out his days in Babylon. Um, but he understood the time for going home to Jerusalem was coming from his study of scripture and the book of Jeremiah in particular on the letter that Jeremiah had written to the captives. Um, but when exactly these visions were given to Daniel, these four visions, uh, it may have been at different stages over his long life of uh, serving God. And he was told to seal them up. They, they weren't really visions for his own time. They were for future generations. They, they would find their way into the scriptures and they would guide the people of God in future generations. But they weren't supposed to be like reading a newspaper that tells you what happened yesterday or what's supposed to be happening today. They, they were there to give you God's perspective on human history and on the battle between the Lord and those who oppose him and oppose his people. So the form of these visions is a cosmic battle. And often in scripture, that makes you think of the, the end of history and the final conflict. But what we seem to have here is telling us about the Greek empire, those who came after Alexander the Great and the various rulers uh, who would rule over different parts of the world that would have influence over the fortunes of Zion, the Jews, um, how they went to war constantly with the Egyptians. You've got uh, the, the people who ruled over the Holy Land and the people they were fighting with, you know, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, various uh, empires, one comes after another, comes after another, but none of them are doing any favours to God's people. And there's idolatry and paganism among them all. And it could become overwhelming. And one of the messages from this book is that Daniel, who received these visions, was overwhelmed. He is often, when God speaks to him or gives him a vision through the work of an angel, um, Daniel feels ill, he feels burdened, he feels just that he can barely cope with it all. Um, and I think in a way that should reassure us that sometimes things get too much for us. Sometimes we come away from the scripture disturbed. Sometimes we'll come away from a gathering of Christians or, or a message and, and all, although it's the Lord's own word and it's all true, the impact that it has on us is, is maybe not to make us feel better in the short term. It might actually make us feel worse. It might remind us of some of the, the difficult themes of Scripture, that God is a king and a judge. Sometimes that's comforting. Sometimes we feel it very much, as Daniel did, we feel it as quite a hard thing to hear. So to give a sort of summary of the last three chapters of the book of Daniel, um, God is clearly the king, the sovereign of history and of all the nations. And empires come and go, kings come and go, but God is in charge of it all. Through it all, God's people face many troubles. They go through suffering. They don't have an easy path. God is working to judge his people and the nations. He's the ancient of days and a day will come according to chapter 7 verse 22 
when the Lord will pronounce judgment in favor of the saints, in favor of his own people. But there are other times before the end of history, before God opens his books and rewards those who have stood up for him, uh, there will be many a day when it looks as if God's people are in trouble and forgotten and that no rescue is coming. But Daniel is being told, look, behind the scenes, God's angels are at work. And the prince, Michael, and the prince that God has set over this region or that region of the world, spiritual beings who obey God, are at work invisibly. There are also evil spiritual beings. There is a demonic realm. Not much about that, Daniel, but you just get this hint that the curtain is being lifted and you're just glimpsing that if, if you were watching the TV news, it would be telling you what the Persians or the Greeks or the Egyptians were doing. But if you lift the curtain behind that, there's a spiritual battle. And God's angels and those who are opposed to God are involved in these battles. And the scripture doesn't say a lot about that. And it's maybe best for us not to try and pry too much. What we can say very definitely is that God's will unfolds, God's will is done, and God's kingdom will most certainly come. One of the, the rulers who is definitely being identified in these chapters is uh, a man called Antiochus IV. That's how he's known to history, or Antiochus Epiphanes. And he was a very corrupt and a very violent man. And he was mm -hmm. falling out all the time, um, especially fighting uh, the, 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 the people who ruled Egypt. And of course, there is this buffer of land between the Greek uh, territories and Egypt, the region where Jerusalem is and where traditionally the people of Israel lived is right in that buffer. So armies coming and going uh, would go through what this section of Daniel calls the beautiful land. They would go through the beautiful land and they would burn up its resources. They would uh, abuse the people. So um, global politics, geopolitics, spiritual conflict. But what's God doing? The history of it all is bringing the exiles home from Babylon, resuming the life of Israel so that the Messiah can come, so that the true descendant of David can come. That's what God is doing. And you would never know that if you just looked at the battles, if you just looked at the geopolitics of it all, you would just think, oh, the world is, is mad and chaotic and it's going from one disaster to another. But if you lift the curtain, God is on the throne, keeping his promises, and he's working things out. Now, there's a task for the church in all of this, for believers. Whenever we read the scripture, there should be an application for us. And what might the application be of being reminded that there's a struggle, that there's suffering, that there's troubles? but that in the midst of it all, God is in control and his purpose in Christ is being worked out. Well, if I can direct you to read with me in chapter 11 of Daniel, chapter 11 and at verse 31. Daniel 11, 31. Hear God's word. Talking about these, these rulers who exalt themselves against one another and indeed against God. Chapter 11, verse 31. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant. But the people who know their God will firmly 
resist him. Verse 33 of chapter 11. Those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. What on earth do these verses say, not only to Daniel's time and those who came after him, what do these verses say to the people of Jesus' time when there was corruption around the temple? To the people of 70 AD when the temple was destroyed? To the people of 2020? The people living for God today? I want to suggest that there is a very clear application to us from all of this. That what God wants us to do is look at his word, look at history, look at the newspaper, and draw three conclusions. The first one is resist. Resist Satan and resist everything that is opposed to God. There's this ruler and this plunderer. And we are, we are told there, but the people who know their God, verse 32, people who know their God will firmly resist him. Resist. Don't give in. The second application is that we are to share the gospel with others, to instruct others. Those who are wise in verse 33 will instruct many by our lives and by what comes out of our mouths. We are to show what it is to be a disciple. And the last application, we are going to keep going, keep resisting. We're going to keep witnessing. And thirdly and lastly, when we stumble, we are going to learn from it and repent. It's not a question of will we stumble. It's, it's certain that we will stumble. All God's people serve him imperfectly. Verse 35 of chapter 11, of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified and made spotless until the time of the end. And that seems to me that that's true in every generation all the way through salvation history, that even those whom you can call the wise, God's people, those who are wise for salvation, will stumble. They'll be discouraged. They'll have bad days. They'll sometimes sin or be plagued with fears and doubts. They will stumble. Of course we will. But learn from it. Be refined and purified through it so that you are made spotless. The purpose of it all is that we would not fight the weapons of this evil world with this world's weapons, but that we would take the action of disciples, that we would turn to the Lord and that we would humble ourselves. It's moral action, spiritual action, it's repentance, it's faith, it's taking risks for the kingdom of God. Now our culture wants us to stumble and when we fall to stay down but Christ says return 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 come back to me what an encouragement the last part of the book of Daniel is so in a minute we're going to read uh, chapter 12 but and maybe discuss it using the questions in the book but I just want to put out um, a question to you that occurs on page 43 of the book. And it's an open question, so, you know, there's no right or wrong answer to this. The question is, what events or possibilities in your future most affect your actions and feelings in the present? 
pretty good question for this strange time that we're living in. I'm just wondering if anyone wants to comment on that. What events or possibilities in your future most affect your actions and feelings for the present? Anybody want to have a go on that one? If you're muted, you may need to unmute yourself. All pretty quiet. I've tired you all out. I'm being a bit thick, Angus, but I don't understand the question. Don't understand the question. Okay. <laughs> So, the, well, that's, that's fine. Uh, I think the question is asking what in the future is most influencing how you feel about things right now? What is it about the future that's having an impact on your life right now? The obvious thing, one of the obvious things at the moment is the coronavirus. Okay, it's not directly in the future, but mm -hmm. it puts it to your mind yeah, how, I think how, how to be a, a, a good witness mm -hmm. to before the Lord takes takes me to be with Him. Thanks. So we've got the virus casting a shadow on just now and the future and, and how we come out of that. And we've got the idea that time is short. To make the a difference. thing about the virus is, you know, in my mind, is that for some reason, it doesn't bother me that much. I mean, that may seem a strange thing to say under the circumstances of thousands that have died, you know, but it just puts into my heart and my mind, you know, how dependent we are on, on God mm -hmm. um, in, in, in that definite way. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, for for others, it, it might be our jobs and security and finance and just you know what's going to happen in the next six twelve months. Um, it it may even be the stage children are at. Will they be able to go to school after the holidays? And there are lots of things that just come into the picture and affect how we're feeling today about the future. We, we can be a bit down about things or we can be very much more positive. Um, I think behind the question though, it's encouraging us to think, well, has God told us things about the future that might comfort us to keep living for him just now? I wonder, perhaps, would, would somebody be willing to read for us chapter 12 of the book of Daniel, um, which is looking to the future and the end of history? Anyone willing to do that for us? Hmm. I'll read I can read it. It's ESV I've got in front of me. But that's okay. Well, if, well, Chris, and I think Murdo was about to offer as oh, well. God. Chris, no. do you want to do verses 1 to 6 and then maybe Murdo can take it from verse 7? Would that be all right? Sure. At that time, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes asleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel... 
roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand towards heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives ever, saying, it will be for a time, times and a half to half a time, when the powers of the holy people has been finally broken. All these things will be completed. I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked, my Lord, what will, what will the outcome of all this be? He replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits or reaches the end of the 1,335 days. As for you, go your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Thank you very much, guys, for, for reading. I will maybe just take a few minutes to try and unpack uh, what that chapter might be saying to us, try and apply it to ourselves. There's, there's a picture of future salvation, future deliverance in the first three verses there. What's it uh, referring to? What's going to happen when God's deliverance comes? Probably verse two, maybe. It's going to be a judgment and a separation of people, some who are going to be given everlasting life and others are going to be judged in a, a negative way. Yeah. So the future plan of God involves a resurrection and there are two resurrections, two to glory and to defeat and to judgment. And uh, that is part of God's response to the evils of history and the work of the devil, that the, the salvation that comes is going to right every wrong, even raising the dead, but it's also going to punish every wrong in eternal separation multitudes who sleep. Looking at verse 4, what is Daniel supposed It looks like um, the message was for the future. And so he was to write it down and sort of seal it up. And in the right time, the message about the Christ and the message about judgment and the, the resurrection would be, would be revealed. Um, it might be helpful if we were to read First Peter chapter 1 verses 10 to 12, 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12. And that tells us about the times that we are living in, 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12. 
This tells us about what the Old Testament prophets like Daniel were all about. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. In, in what sense do we live in the time of the end that Daniel and the angel spoke about in Daniel 12? I think we're in the end times because uh, Jesus has died on the cross. I, I, I apologize, I lost my sound and I lost the vision there, but I got back. Um, yeah, we're in the last in the last times because of Jesus has been uh, prophesied by the, the the prophets in the Old Testament, and um, till he returns, we we are in the last last days. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, Alex. Yeah, that's right. So we we are living in the last days, and. Peter's message essentially is all these prophecies from long ago, um, they may have baffled people for centuries, but now that Christ has come, the, the meaning and the, the impact of them comes home to you all. So live today, behave today as those who are in the last days. Christ has come, tell the nations there's nothing left to be done but believe the gospel and live for the glory of God and build his kingdom, for it shall most surely come. Um, question eight on page 46 asks, what question is asked in Daniel 12, verse six? What answer is given? And how does Daniel feel about the answer? In verses seven to eight. So, who's going to have a go at that one? What's the question and how does Daniel feel about it? So he asks, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? Mm -hmm. And then the answer that he's given is um, that it would be for a time, times and half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. And essentially, he says that he's not really, he doesn't understand. I heard, but I did not understand. Mm -hmm. Which might be exactly how we feel about it just now as we're mm -hmm. reading this. Um, the little note, if you've got the book in front of you at the foot of the page, just draws our eye to the last book of the New Testament, Revelation 12, which uses the same language of a time, times and half a time. So a time and two times uh, is three times and half a time. It's three and a half years. And Daniel doesn't know what this is on about at all. But in Revelation 12, that three and a half year period is applied to, it's a fixed time, it's a limited time, and it covers the whole time between the death and resurrection of Jesus and the return of Jesus. A time, times, and half a time. And it's, you know, the time between Christ's humbling and his glory, it's actually quite short. It's like three and a half years. His ministry was three, just over three years. So maybe, maybe that's where that figure was chosen. Daniel's told it's it's a relatively short time. He doesn't really understand it. A very similar book looking at the end of history 
revelation ties it to really the history of the church and is saying these are the last days when we're waiting for the dead to be raised. Satan is having a go, but who's in charge? The Lord is in charge. And finally, we will see that God does not abandon or forget his people. I'm comforted that Daniel didn't understand. He got the message. He passed it on, but it confused him. Some things are clear in the Bible. What we need for salvation is pretty clear. Some things are not so clear. We don't need to understand it all right now to trust Christ and to keep following him. Question nine. How should Daniel and how should we respond to this glimpse of the future that he was given, the the future with resurrection and what have you? Um, Verses 12 and 13 especially, maybe will give us an answer. How should Daniel and how should we respond? To hold on to our faith and our beliefs. That's right. Keep going and wait for your inheritance that will not perish or spoil or fade. It seems that Daniel spent the whole of his his life and his uh, pilgrimage as a believer in Babylon as a captive among captives. And although he he had a role interpreting uh, visions and, and dreams and the writing it was on the wall for King Belteshazzar and although he stood up to foolish laws under King Darius um, some things hadn't really changed very much by the end of his life but he's consistent he's a man of prayer and he's listening to the voice of God all the way through and at the end of his his ministry, the last thing that's recorded that was revealed to him is this encouragement. As for you, go your way till the end. You will rest. I think that means you're, you're going to die. And then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. You might not get back to the land, the beautiful land, but you will get into the land that matters. You will get into the Lord's everlasting new creation and you will be raised from the dead. Now, um, the book of Daniel, some, some of us have come into this at the end of your study. Some of you have been with it all the way through. I'm just wondering... Um, there's a general question there, verse, question 10, that you can maybe try and answer it even if you've just come in quite, quite cold to these studies. How would the truths about God, about the world and about the future that were revealed in these visions, how would they have enabled Daniel to live as he did in Babylon, do you think? The sort of follow-up question is how how do they help us as we kind of live in Babylon today? So does anyone want to have a go at responding to how the word should have spoken to Daniel and how it should be speaking to us and challenging us? I think the underlying um, aspects would be he would be encouraged. It was to encourage him. That yeah. God was a, a God of reality uh, and revealed himself in different ways to Daniel and protected him, that it was a means of encouragement. Thank you. Um, Any other thoughts? Um, Daniel, hold. Um, Sorry. Um, sure what noise we're hearing there but it seems to have stopped <laughs> <laughs> right 
it's not me either. <laughs> not me either. <laughs> I think one thing was that Daniel was told, Daniel knew the end, the, 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 the end of the story, if you like, and that's putting it sort of uh, simply, you know, but he's told, go your way. Uh, and I think so later on, it sort of says to close the book and, you know, you, Daniel, are, are, are safe. Yeah. So Daniel knew um, the outcome, I suppose, if you like. The verse, the verse that was coming to my mind, uh, just uh, reading at the end of Daniel there about waiting and then going your way was from Psalm 130, where it says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I keep my hope. So that mixture that we wait, but we also keep going, and we keep our hope in the Lord. That's very helpful. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. I think it says somewhere else that God would bless him and he would receive his allotted inheritance. I think it says. Yes. Yes, well. the, last, the very last verse of the book says that. Was it right? <laughs> yeah, right, okay. Uh, and verse 12 has the, I think, Anne, you had the word blessed. Well, that's in verse 12 as well. Mm -hmm. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the. 1,335 days, there's a time, two times and half a time, three and a half years. The, however long God makes you wait, <clears throat> even if it seems extended for a little bit, however long you have to wait, wait in faith, wait in prayer, and blessed is the one who reaches the end of the time of waiting and greets the Saviour who comes again in great glory. So I think really the application of this book is keep going. Don't be overwhelmed, but keep looking to the sovereign Lord and keep your eye on him and keep worshipping him. It's not easy to do that in this time of lockdown, though, when we miss so many of the, the comforts and and the strengths that we would normally have. Would anyone like to, to speak about um, what's keeping them going or keeping them fresh in their um, walk with the Lord in, in this time when we don't have all the benefits of gathering and singing and public worship? What's keeping you going? We've been finding it very encouraging to teach Aoife. We've, you know, got all this extra time at home and we're making the use to try and set up better habits in terms of family worship, you know, spending time morning and evening with her and, and getting that habit established with her and just teaching her, you know, the Bible's about God and Jesus and that we can talk to God and Jesus and using that using the spare time that we've got as our opportunity to really establish good habits that maybe been in shift work aren't always there. That's really helpful. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm, I'm very tempted to ask you if you'll, you'll say a wee piece to camera along these lines sometime to just <laughs> on as a tip to, to other mums and dads in the congregation. My better half's giving a thumbs up to that. So we're going to take a wee vote now, do we think? <laughs> McLeod should do a wee two or three minute um, clip for the congregation on promoting family worship. Vote now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I think that was overwhelming. <laughs> Thanks for hearing, Chris. Good stuff. Look forward to getting that. <laughs> Good. Well, one of my lockdown pleasures is listening to your singing, Chris. Actually, it's been really helpful to have. Um, I've got a CD somewhere, uh, Worship for Small Rooms. It's, I think it was designed for house churches or something, but mm -hmm. we're kind of doing a lot of that now where we, we're we not in a big congregation. So it's, it's really quite comforting to have singing from another home that um, speaks to our hearts in our homes. We're grateful for, for these things. 
any other thoughts on what keeps us going, keeps us fresh, or what the Lord might be wanting us to learn? What, what's uh, yeah? Sorry. Um, yeah. What what keeps me going is is growing things. Can you hear? Me? Yeah, growing things in the garden, um, being next to nature, and seeing the the birds that fly around and just learning from sowing seed and seeing it just come up different diff at different times. And I think there's a lot of spiritual lessons that you can learn from being a gardener. I think there was a book that, that, that when I was doing some, some, when I was at Missionary Bible College um, at, at uh, Mission with WEC, um, I did a, a, some kind of small thesis and, and this lady, typed it for me and she asked for a, a book and I, that was her, the, re, the reward she wanted, didn't want anything else. And I got to this book and it said, my, my, my father is a gardener. My father is a gardener. Mm -hmm. and, and he is, um, he, he, he's unseen to us. We are, we are growing, but we can't often see it um, as we, as we, look at to things in nature we see we see life all around thank you Alan. and that helps us to meditate a wee bit too mm -hmm. so for a walk recently with with Anne and we we were in a quiet spot out in the hills near a wee loch and we saw two foxes come out of the forest and uh, I, I did think of that verse in song of songs about the little that there were no vines up there needing to be spoiled yeah. by them but it, uh, it was just kind of cute to see there's not many humans about. And so the, the wildlife is um, maybe uh, breathing more easily because there's not so many of us around. But uh, it's nice to see them and mm. appreciate the creator's hand and all of that. Well, we, we maybe have a, a moment or two for, for prayer. Any last thoughts anyone would like to share um, or indeed re requests for prayer? It was just uh, a, a message from uh, Believer's Portal came through that in the last week, 250, uh, I would say, would, would be Christians or uh, people that are um, in the north of Nigeria have been killed by Boko Haram again. And, and uh, it's, it's just dreadful that, that there's such a, a, a waste of life. Uh, and it's, it's not only men, it's women and children. And... Uh, it's just, just awful. Thanks. Poor Nigeria is really, really struggling. Somebody mentioned to me today how bad the coronavirus is becoming in India at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, there are great fears that there'll be terrible waste of life there and huge poverty, of course, as a result of all their suffering. So there's human evil, there's natural disasters. Maybe just pray for a spiritual softening in our own nation that will not grow harder or more materialistic after this warning from the Lord, but that we'll be humbled and grow softer. Um, I think some people are being softened. I don't think there's any doubt about that, but mm. sadly suffering can make us worse, not better. Mm -hmm. So... Well, maybe we can just have have a, a sort of open time of prayer. If, if, if a couple of folk would like to pray, that would be really helpful. And uh, we'll finish in five or ten minutes, just depending on how, how we get on. And uh, this is being shared on, on YouTube, so just you might want to bear that in mind. If anyone would like to pray. <clears throat>